We'll, um, we'll get started. Um, just an introduction to myself, just to begin with. I'm Sam Marriage. I work for my family business, which is called Marriages. Um, we make flour, animal feed, and pet foods. Um, but I've been asked to talk today about small animal nutrition. So, unfortunately, our nutritionist can't make it, so you're going to have to put up with me. But um, I'll work through it best we can. Um, I sit on the PFMA and I represent small animal and wild bird um, and on our industry um, body and small animals something that we spend a lot of time talking about particularly in regards to the herbivores where there's been a lot of research recently uh, which has highlighted a, a, a lack of understanding at retail and consumer level as well as to a certain extent within the industry about how herbivores are different to a lot of the other animal species that we possibly know a little bit more about. So a herbivore, which is a, a guinea pig and a hamster, are both herbivores. These are plant-eating animals, so an omnivore will have some proteins and mainline proteins or insect proteins in their diet. A herbivore would just survive naturally on, on plant matter, so that's a very important first feature. These animals are crepuscular, which means that they will normally be active at night. They will normally eat at night and forage at night and come out in the most active at night, which is a really important factor with feeding as well as a lot of other behaviours that people don't often recognise about rabbits and guinea pigs. This is a really important fact, so rabbits and guinea pigs have a different digestive tract. They're monogastric, which means they've got one stomach like ourselves, but they have a process called hindgut fermentation, which means it's actually a secondary digestive, it's a second part of their digestive system, which makes them much better at fermenting fibre, which we'll come on to a little bit better, but this is a real important part of any sort of nutritional work that we do on herbivores and um, the monogastrics. So this, uh, this means that they are eating their own faeces, so a very important part of the hindgut fermentation is that they will then reconsume certain components of what they excrete and redigest it, and that's one of the things that makes them very efficient um, in, in, digest, in digesting fibre. So naturally, rabbits and guinea pigs will have a diet that is made up of grasses, leaves, certain herbs and flowers, a little bit of fibrous bark and young bark, um, but they will also eat a certain amount of grain. There's a big trend and we've just done a great free diet at the moment, but in a natural diet of a rabbit, they will eat certain amounts of grains and higher starch products. So and they will naturally op optimally forage. So if there are high density nutritious foods there, they will eat them. So there is a risk with rabbits that they will, um, that they, they, they will become obese if you feed them a lot of starchy foods. So the digestive tracts of guinea pigs and rabbits are very, very similar. Actually, a guinea pig is slightly better at digesting fibre than a rabbit, but you can see it's a very similar digestive tract with a stomach, a small intestine, the cecum, which is a very important part that we will come on to later, and then the large intestine leading to the rectum. And the th difference in these digestive tracts and the sorts of droppings that we were speaking about earlier, where we say that they reconsume some of their droppings, they'll have two types of droppings. They have a, a sticky, soft dropping, which is called a psychotrove, which is basically a dropping that is still very nutritious, it's part digested, and it's almost pre-digested to make it easier to absorb when consumed. Again, it's a fairly sticky, mucus-typed faeces, and you don't often see them because the rabbit will consume them pretty much as soon as it's excreted them. Then you have a very hard, fibrous dropping, which is the waste product where most of the nutrients have been taken out, and I'll show you a bit more about that later. Covers most of that. So looking in a bit more detail at the digestive tract and why these guys are different. So they're consuming food into the stomach, there's some absorption that takes place in the small intestine. And then this is the bit that's interesting in rabbits. In our, ourselves, we've developed as we've eaten more and more meat and more and more starchy products to have a very small cecum. So our large intestine almost goes straight into the small intestine and the cecum is, 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 doesn't do an awful lot of work. In rabbits and guinea pigs, where the fibre fermentation is much more important, the cecum is very developed. And what happens is as things pass through the small intestine to the large intestine, there's a filtering process, a muscular process, that pushes the large particle sizes down and the smaller particle sizes up into the cecum. And this is mainly the indigestible fibre, which is pushed down, and the digestible fibres are pushed into the cecum. Um, and then the microbial um, balance and everything helps that then to be fermented within the cecum. 
is then formed into the sticky psychotrophs, which are the ones that are going to be reconsumed. And when these are large enough, they're then caught within this muscular system at the bottom of the cecum and pushed down through the large intestine to the rectum. So in indigestible fibre is very important in making this whole system flow. But digestible fibre is their main source of energy and nutrients within the cecum. So this is just to show you the difference between the two sorts of faeces. Um, so these are the soft faeces that are reconsumed psychotrophs, and these are the hard faeces. So in a, in a normal monogastric animal, these will be excreted, and these will be excreted. So all of these nutrients will be lost. By re-eating these faeces, the psychotrophs, they will then benefit from the absorption of this extra protein, particularly the vitamin K, so they're getting three times as much vitamin K, nearly twice as much protein through this um, more complicated monogastric um, digestive tract that they've got. So everything that we're doing when we're trying to formulate a mix is keeping the right microbial balance in the cecum so that we get the optimum fibre fermentation whilst getting the right amount of indigestible fibre to flush this system through. My rabbit's disappeared here, but this was the PFMA rabbit showing the correct proportions of what to feed. But unfortunately, for some reason, the presentation laptop doesn't like it here. So uh, what, what, what it's saying in, in the main is the main body of the rabbit is hay. Hay should be fed ad lib. It should be good quality hay. And that should always be there for them. I'll tell you a bit more about that. Muesli's or pellets. We'll come on to that a bit later, but there should be some sort of supplementation of vitamins. We're not feeding them natural grass, we're not feeding them green grass, and they're not going to have the ability to forage in the way they would in the wild. So it's very important that we supplement their diets with controlled vitamin and mineral intakes. So we, we, we have to do that through some sort of manufactured food. We also need um, some leafy greens, really. That's as much a behavioural thing as a nutritional thing, but it's very important for them if they're kept in captivity to have things to do and that's where treats and the leafy greens can be important and water's very important so I'll come on to that a bit later. So on hay, hay, there's a lot of talk about hay, there's a lot of brands of hay, a lot of people speak about Timothy hay and things. The most important thing is it's a grass hay. Um, some people feed alpha alpha which is actually a legume, it's not actually a grass and it has a much higher protein and calcium level which can lead to irritation within their digestive tract. So you should really feed a grass hay that's not too high in, in protein, good high fibre source, fairly low calcium and fairly low sugar levels. And um, there's Timothy's one that everyone talks about. There are more commercially grown ones like some of the Fiskars grasses and things now which are equally as good um, and a little bit less pricey than some of the Timothy hay. But, um, hay is also very important for dental wear. Um, it creates the right movement to the rabbit's jaw which is a cross movement which is what creates the tooth wear. So, Hay is very important in getting the tooth wear within rabbits and we see a lot of issues from vets and people with um, teeth issues with rabbits. So good, good quality hay should be free from mould, weeds and contamination. So it should look good and smell good. And if it looks good and smells good, it probably is good. Um, different types of fibre. So you'll see a lot of people talk about total fibre, beneficial fibre, crude fibre. Um, and this confuses a lot of people. Um, fibre is split into sort of two main categories, digestible and indigestible fibre. Um, and so these added together will give you total dietary fibre. Indigestible fibre is, is similar to crude fibre. And what you're looking at with a rabbit, normally fibre, when we're talking about diets, is a byproduct and something nobody's very keen on because most people are about getting high level nutritionally dense foods into animals so they grow quicker or perform better and that sort of thing. So fibre is normally just talking about crude fibre and it's almost something that people want to be low. Rabbits are very, very different. This is very important. Um, their fibre is their main source of nutrition through the fermentation in the cecum. So the digestible fibre is very important to them, which is why people talk about total fibre and beneficial fibre because they're getting made, most of their nutrition from that. So the indigestible fibre is mainly um, ligulose, cellulose, um, and it's within here with the lindings of the cell, this is in the cell walls and the outer part of the thing, and that's what keeps the gut mobility um, going and is all about pushing everything else through the system. The digestible fibre is more of the inner cell wall and is what's broken down by the fibre fermentation in the cecum. Can we cover most of those points? Yeah. 
and this is the very important thing on the indigestible fibre is the uh, mobility of the digestive tract. Vitamin C is another thing that people talk about a lot, particularly in relation to guinea pigs, because guinea pigs can't synthesise their own vitamin C. It's a very important antioxidant to guinea pigs, um, as well as being you know, obviously a typical um, vitamin, which is very important in the um, absorption of iron. So it's very important that we supplement vitamin C and that we do it with a very stable vitamin C and put it in, in a reliable source for guinea pigs because it's naturally a fairly unstable vitamin so the supplementation of foods vitamin C in guinea pigs is an absolutely essential one to get right and you need between 700 and 1000 millibars of, of um, vitamin C in a, in a good diet per 100 grams so this is, these are the six steps to well-being so this is something that we've been through in a lot of detail to try and encourage people to do the right things for their rabbits clean water is very important rabbits are prone to dehydration um, and they tend not to drink enough so something that we need to all be conscious of is to make sure water is always available for them and they're actually encouraged to drink it um, and that means keeping keep clean and fresh and doing everything we can to keep our rabbits drinking as much as they can quality hay we've been through Nutri-Press pellets is one that we've actually just entered an award and won a new product award for which is fantastic news for us um, and this is a new technology that we've bought out this year which we're looking to introduce and talk about a bit more, but I'll, I'll say, say a few words about that later. Um, and then treats, again, all about interaction, behaviour, well-being. These are naturally foraging animals, so keeping them interested is a really important thing for us. Um, and then daily greens, the same. And then this is a really important point that a lot of people leave off their guide to well-being, being food people, we tend to talk about nutrition. But the RSPCA have put forward recommendations that every rabbit should be able to stretch out in its hutch, that it should be allowed to do three hops. And we're still seeing a lot of rabbits kept in very small hutches, and very confined spaces, which repress, depresses um, natural behaviour. So they're really important if you're buying rabbit hutches or anything. It's an important thing to make sure there's enough space for the rabbit to move and express natural behaviour within that space. Fresh greens, there's some things that are good, there's some things that are bad. The sort of key rule of thumb is that they don't want sugary, sweet treats. You know, Bugs Bunny always eats carrots, but he probably shouldn't. Um, you know, carrot is a bad treat because it's obviously very high in sugar. So those sorts of things we want to try and avoid, and fruits we want to try and avoid, which are very high in sugar. Stick more, again, with the sort of fibrous, leafy um, and herby type, um, type greens. Treats, yeah, again, don't, don't feed sugary treats. It can affect the digestive system. It can create um, issues with um, diarrhoea and soft feces and it makes the whole sort of digestive tract not and the microbial balance in the cecum. It can affect um, if, if the sugar levels get too high. And also rabbits are very good at absorbing nutrients, so they will absorb things um, in, in, in much more readily than, than some of the other animals. So if we put too much sugars in, we can put strain on certain other functions. So Nutripress, this is a process that we're launching this year. Traditionally, rabbit foods have been extruded because most dog and cat food people are extruders. The Nutripress pellet is a cold pressed pellet, so this is very on trend for us with cold pressing and grain free and everything. So we're now doing a, a, a long cut, high fibre, long fibre, um, dense um, rabbit pellets, which is much more in keeping with their natural digestive system and also it's not cooking the ingredients so hot so we're not getting the same depletion of nutrients that we would in something like extruding which would go maybe up to 150 degrees we're trying to hit about 70 80 degrees which will give us a good microbial count a good safe food but not cooking any hotter than we need to cook it to to achieve those sort of levels um, and then by cooking it by whether it's extrusions or pellets what we're doing is making it more digestible, more palatable, because some of the bigger molecules are broken down into slightly smaller, sweeter, so the starch is broken down into sugars, which makes it more palatable, but also stabilizing some of the nutrients. So pelleting of whatever sort is, is very useful in, um, in, when it comes to sort of trying to form a complete diet for your animal. And this again is about the cold pressing. By not eating it quite as hot, we don't genetize as many of the larger starch molecules into sugars and things which is generally better for how, how a rabbit wants to feed, it wants very slow digestion um, passing through it, not, not rapid absorption that you would want in a predatory animal or a carnivore, or even certain om omnivores. Prebiotics is another one that we just sort of thought we'd touch on, because um, people sort of have heard of it but don't really know what it is. So you've got pre and probiotics, 
Probiotics are living organisms that we put into the digestive tract to help aid the, um, the in this case, the, the fermentation of fibre and the microbial balance in the gut, and it helps keep the balance between pathogenic and bad bacteria, and good bacteria, right? So, in our case, we use things like yeast as a prebiotic, and it's a live organism, microorganism that we're putting into the food to help with that process. And the prebiotic is really the food that that is going to feed upon. So we've got the probiotic doing the work and we've got the prebiotic encouraging these good microorganisms to do the good work that they do for us in the digestive system. Um, and you can't actually use prebiotics, uh, probiotics in, in all the ha 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 um, guinea pig diets yet because they're not licensed. But in, in the rabbit diets, we're putting probiotics and prebiotics. In the, in the guinea pig diets, we're just putting prebiotics and looking for ways that we can improve that. Yeah, so these are some of the benefits, obviously improving the immune system, the absorption, the quality of feces and the gut mobility with the prebiotics. Really important feature in rabbit foods, being very important in the work that we've been doing. Selective feeding, this is a bit of a, 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 a me having a moan slide because it's hijacked by a lot of people. The selective feeding, we just looked at the slide, you must feed hay, hay must be ad lib, it must be a majority of the diet. So we are going to be selectively feeding. We can't just feed hay, we can't just feed pellets. Yeah, it is going to be a mixed diet. So this is a, 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 a bit of wording that is often hijacked, particularly when talking about mueslis and pellets. Whatever we're feeding, one really strong consumer message and retail message that we've got to get across is animals will selectively feed and they will preferentially feed. So it is very important that whatever you feed, whoever's diet you feed, you follow the manufacturers and guidelines and you make them eat the right quantities of that diet, otherwise whatever you feed you will have problems. Um, so, so some benefits of mueslis are that it allows them to express natural behaviour, it allows them to forage, it, um, it keeps them entertained. If you can feed a muesli diet it's well formulated by a good manufacturer and you can feed it well so they eat the right amounts at the right times, that, 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 that's fine, they can work very well and it can have certain welfare benefits to your rabbit over pellets. But if you've got multiple rabbits and, or you can't get them to eat certain things, um, yeah, it's very important then that in that case you probably look to a pelleted diet because it's probably easier and slightly easier to control what consumption they take in, but it does take away some of the interest and natural behaviour in, in, in how they consume that diet. So that was it. A brief introduction to, to rabbits and guinea pigs. I can, um, I can take any questions if you like. Or you can come and see me on the stand. <laughs>